Hello, 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 everybody. We're back for another. Welcome in, folks. Good to see you. Hey, chat. How's it going? All right. I'm going to not touch that. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Sorry about uh, the late start today. Audio problems continue. We, I, I do have a cord coming to replace the problems that we have, but right now we're still dealing with some of the same old issues. How's it going, guys? Welcome in. Good to see you. Welcome to the stream. File on in, file on in. We got a good day planned today. It's a short stream. Uh, I did start late, and I've also, for anybody who is a Twitch subscriber or YouTube channel member, supporter of any kind, uh, we will be having the Citizen Central podcast. It's going to be exclusive to supporters this month. Uh, we'll be doing a couple extra episodes, but this one will be exclusive to supporters and it'll be starting at about two hours over on the discord. So this stream will be running a little bit short because got to make good time for them. Regardless though, I cherish the time we have together. How are you doing? Welcome Josh, Cotton, Mushrooms, Nove. Good to see a Cactus, Pungy with the toes, Jim, Israel, M Mr. Endomi, Swagasaurus, Josh, and Goodspeed. Enjoying a day off. Glad you caught me. A lot of ways. Glad you got to spend your day off in here. It's an honor. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. Yef, yes. What's up? No red face today? No red face. Just a normal old brown face. <laughs> um, but no. <laughs> the uh, Halloween has ended. Now we're on to Christmas. Now Christmas starts. I got to change my profile picture from a spooky tomato to a what is it um what do you a santa claus tomato i guess santa tomato we call him 30k and the glitches killed your verse um you guys in game what do you guys who's who's playing what all right i it sounds like everybody's in pyro you guys been playing pyro i realize that i'm probably uh falling off the wayside of interesting or at least new stuff today, as we're covering CitizenCon, which is old news now. Pyro is out. But um, I, I think they're dropping more panels now. Why don't we go over it, talk about it, get it in detail. <clears throat> Good speed, I appreciate you. Don't forget Thanksgiving. Holy crap, how could I forget Thanksgiving? I got too excited for Christmas. Are you allowed to play? I have no idea. I don't know who or is not. It's I can think kind of like a lottery system. <clears throat> sort of like how they do the PTU. Pyro didn't release for the plebs yet, right? No, it is in a very, very unstable testing branch right now. So not it's not necessarily the best state. I can play. I have access. Um, but I have played. I played at CitizenCon and um, <clears throat> I had a schedule for today. We're going over panels. Pyro can come. Pyro will always be there, you know? Pyro's yesterday's news, today's Nick's. Imagine, though. Imagine if they were like, hey, so we put Pyro in the experimental branch. Uh, we're going to go ahead and throw Nick's into the PTU. <laughs> that would be really... That would be... Uh, huh. Did I hear the third variant of the cutter is a C-nut truck? I could see it being a like a pizza delivery van, but... I could also see it being the um, reclaimer ship, little snub ship. Pyro should be closed for the day. Why is that? Was there an accident? Did somebody spill the milk on aisle six again? Three point twenty one point one PTU wave one today, apparently. Huh? You know what? That would probably be even more interesting than Pyro. How funny is that? I would take vehicle tractor beams over pyro. You'd probably have more fun with it. <clears throat> it's only open for eight hours a day. Oh, I see. Ha. Huh. Okay, so everybody's kind of getting off of pyro now. Interesting. Yeah, that's right. They had a schedule up for it. Opened at 6 a.m. PST. Well, then it's only been open for four hours. Yeah, I'd take those vehicle tractor beams. Those are... um. That's a big change. Like the, the Argo SRV. 
Very cool addition. Thought uh, food truck with torpedo burritos, but you don't know how the side windows will work with the thrusters. <laughs> you know the little armored side windows next to the front of the cutter? Just throw throw that throw out of there. Throw the burritos out that window. Greetings, ethnification. So <clears throat> we've got uh we've got citizen con. We got more citizen con stuff to go over, yeah? Ships. Who's uh who's watched this panel since it happened live? Because I haven't watched this one all the way through. We watched a little bit of it. I did some for the uh retaliator modularity video, but like I haven't really dove into this one yet. Pyro is actually really cool. That being said, someone rammed you with a redeemer and you started to spin for three minutes before crashing into the ground. No, I, I think Pyro is pretty sick. It feels different from Stanton, which, you know, is a success on its own, I think. <clears throat> and then you got factions and stuff. Everyone is talking about Pyro, but what can we really do in Pyro that make the game more enjoyable? Well, from from my limited playtime, Pyro's locations are much more in-depth. So you're not going to like a rest stop and running through three rooms and then that's the whole station. You have so much, like the space stations are almost the size of city landing zones and they have missions on them. Uh, they have factions in them. They have uh, places to shop, places to get food. There's a lot of like world building going on. It's not super interactive, but they're huge space stations. Besides that, the ground locations themselves are way bigger. So you're not going down for a bunker mission and going down to a room and clearing out 10 guys and leaving. You're going to a small town and you're fighting through a settlement with a bunch of different types of um, cover, with different approaches, different sight lines. Um, what else is there? I mean, there's the new planets, obviously, so you're getting... Better planets, better looking planets, more interesting surfaces. That's not super tangible. But it's mostly like the missions and the way they play out actually feel different. It's not just a new coat of paint. This is a different type of game. I mean, we don't have settlements in Star Citizen. We don't, we have derelict settlements, but those are rarely occupied and pretty glitchy. These are, um, these are more like small cities. Yeah, the, the space stations are huge. So like for all the people who are, you know, coming out and being like, oh yeah, it's Pyro, but it's just the same game in a new system. It's not. It's not drastically different. It's not the same Pyro we should expect when it goes live, for sure. There, there needs to be a lot more, but there are new factions. There are new missions. There are new places for those missions. There are new amounts of enemies in those missions. There are new enemies in those missions. What else do you need for it to be different? You can get reputation differently. The the space stations themselves are different. Oh, the flare stuff is annoying. See, I didn't get that. Yeah, in my time in Pyro, I spent uh, twenty five of my thirty of my forty minutes in the space station, so I didn't actually see the flare. Yeah, the settlements you can land at. There are both friendly and non friendly settlements, which we didn't have before either. No jump points. It's still a it's still a very limited system. Like I said, it's not the system we should expect on live, um, and it's not what we should expect after all this time. It's still just a test, and a pretty small one at that. But the stuff that we do get plays different from Stanton, in my opinion. Pyro will probably be in the PU whenever we get uh, server meshing working, in the PU. I I would guess next summer at the earliest, but who knows. It sounds like there's a lot of variability in the timeline right now. I don't know if there's going to be Pyro 5 platforms at the Gas Giant. It might just be an uninhabited Gas Giant. The system is pretty much pretty, pretty frontier, you know? Step forward is good news, yeah. Yeah, I think I think this will be in PTU for a while. Um, 
maybe they'll bring it maybe they'll bring pyro to the pu through a branch i think it would be weird though if it went into the pu without jump points so i think it's gonna have to wait until jump points are working which would mean until server meshing was working which you know i, I to be safe i would guess no more than no less than six months but who knows we'll, we'll see what kind of news is coming out over the next couple of weeks and months i mean Maybe they'll get server meshing working in first quarter of next year. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? M. Walker, thank you for the sub. Appreciate you. Really appreciate you uh, coming to share in the knowledge. I learned from chat. Chat learns from me. We get good talks. Star Citizen's fun. Yay. All right. So we've got this ship panel. And... Uh, We've got a few interesting ships coming up on here. Uh, they they bring all their hype beasts in, the Merchantman and the Polaris. Um, but they go over a couple other ships and have one of the more annoying parts of Citizen Con, in my opinion, during this panel. So we'll get to all that. But this is a talking ship, Citizen Con 2953. Let's see what they have to say. Cheers, everybody. Hi everyone. Have we all have we all had a good morning looking at cool stuff? Great. Uh, my name is John Crew. I'm the vehicle director here at Cloud Imperium Games. And uh, my name is Ben Curtis. I am the vehicle art director at CIG. So we're going to spend the next 40, 45 minutes talking ship. Uh, we're going to show you some cool stuff that you've hopefully seen, some cool stuff that you're not supposed to have seen, but you probably already have, uh, and some cool stuff. Again, you're not supposed to have seen, but what you've seen is wrong. So hopefully we can <laughs> clear that up for you all. Right, so that was the A1 Spirit trailer. Pretty cool video. Um, but we're now going to do a bit of a slightly deeper dive into the actual art and visuals of the ship. Okay, can I, can I clarify? Because Mrs. Tomato said I love John Crew. For what it's worth, I, I asked John Crew earlier in the day if he was going to be, if he was nervous. Um, and he said he wasn't, but other people were because they were presenting. And I was like, oh, you're not talking? He's like, no. <laughs> and then we went and watched this panel. And I was like, hmm? No, this is the same thing we got at CitizenCon. We're just replaying and, and diving deep. Moving to the heart of the ship, this area is kind of like really dominated by those 10 sci fi bombs. And then we go straight into engineering where you find the rest of the ship components that it needs. So, this is the A1, we already have this. Up front, we've got a completely fully featured habitation area, suit lockers, weapon lockers, pod beds, everything you're going to need. And then Right at the cockpit, we have a two pilot cockpit and I think the Crusader engineers have done a fantastic job of putting everything that the pilot needs right at their fingertips. So you know, in the heat of battle, you kind of might just eke out that advantage. No suit lockers. I swear Stereo I saw a suit locker. Tips. Crusader engineers, you're going to area. Engineering, weapon lockers, a... pod bay, completely free. Right there, yeah, there's a suit locker. There's two of them. Um, I like this interior. I like the compactness of it. I like that the whole living space feels like it's right there in the cockpit. Um, I think this feels like a perfect sort of, like, uh, this feels like a perfect sort of personal ship, like perfect size, you know, you got your bed right there. So you wake up and you're in your pilot seat. You got your suit locker there so you can quickly get into your suit if you need to, like your whole shower and bathroom setup is in here. Everything is right there. I really like that. But I don't like this. I don't want bombs. I don't care about bombs. Don't give me bombs. All right. Like, what am I going to bomb? Hmm? My friend once. <laughs> and then he's going to and then he's going to uh, come back half an hour later because I 
blew him up and he had to respawn. Like, I can't wait for the C1. I really wish they had shown the work on the C1 here. It's kind of... I don't know why not. Would have been nice to, to... I feel like the C1's probably in final art, and it would have been cool to see that as well. And even the E1 just would have been a solid update, but maybe they didn't want to be like, oh yeah, we introduced all three of these at CitizenCon. Here they are again at all CitizenCon. It's kind of what it is, though. And I like the ship. Need. I just don't like bombing. Fantastic job of putting everything that the pilot needs right at their fingertips. So you're in the heat of battle, you kind of might just eke out that advantage. Exterior-wise, it's classic Crusader. We've got our recess weapons. I bombed it. We've got our rear-mounted uh, remote turret. They will cease to be my and then friend. Underneath is Yo, I'm actually kind of surprised that they went with this rail-mounted uh, turret. You guys know about this? Weapons. So this turret back here, you can kind of see it's got a rail. And it fires from the top here, and then it uh, rear -mounted, translates uh, all the way turret. back and rotates around to the bottom here as like a combat turret. This would be pretty cool to do if like the ship was landed and this was something that you were loading vehicles into maybe. Um, I guess all you need as a bomber is to just keep people off your back until you can get enough distance that they need to go back and check on whatever it is you just blew up. But like... I wish that uh, I had a ship like this that I was going to be loading stuff into. Yeah, it's like the Scorpius turret. Because can you imagine being like on the battlefield? Somebody's trying to get their, their last vehicle into the, the ramp and you've got the turret right here on the bottom. Just annihilating whoever's chasing them with, the, I think, their size twos. But yeah, the, the rail turret in the, on the Scorpius makes less sense than it does for me on here. Because on here, you're not going to be flipping around constantly like you would dogfighting on a heavy fighter. And then underneath is all business. We've got the missile racks and we've got the big bomb bays. And you cannot launch bombs that fast. Has anybody figured out how to launch bombs that quickly? Because I couldn't. They, the they had to wait. Racks and we've got the big bomb bays. <laughs> and I think overall, you know, Crusader have done it again. They've done a, you know, amazing job of packaging something that's like super feature rich and something stylish, sleek, looks fast, but still super aggressive. I feel like the, you know what would have sold the most in this sort of class and like size? An M1 variant. Imagine an, an, a spirit M1, extra armor, extra shields, um, a, a bay in the back that's large enough for small vehicles, a couple extra guns, a manned turret, or, or maybe it's still a remote turret, and it still has this turret in the back. Like, that's what I want, right? Holy crap, that'd be cool. That would be such a great little strike vehicle you could drop in, just like the uh, the M2 in the commercial for the, the, literally the M2 Starlifter, where they're dropping in and dropping Nova tanks. Like, you could do that so much faster with something like this. That'd be awesome. That would have sold like crazy. I'm surprised they didn't do an M1. They went with an E1. Um, yeah, the E1 instead. Looks fast, but still super aggressive. And then here is one last look. Oh, why not? Okay, that was one last look of the interior. This is cool. I wish they did this with all the ships. Uh, so we had a really cool cutaway that you half saw. I'm sure we can show you that again later. Um, if you like what you saw there, that is available now on that link and a QR code there that hopefully takes you to M1 the M1 troop place. carrier? Yeah, an armed troop um, carrier, that'd be cool. So that is available in Alpha 321, which went live Thursday. I've honestly lost track of time the last few days. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the current. Let's talk about something a bit further in the past. What about the C1, though? So... We have a timeline here from the uh, today all the way through to today in in game, and throughout that time period, we have our manufacturers in law, starting with RSI in the very near future, uh, going all the way through uh, to Mirai, which is this year in game. So this is interesting. I mean, we know most of this stuff, but there's a couple brands left out here. I'm pretty sure Consolidated Outlands, it's supposed to be like right here where my head is actually. Like right, right here, it's it's pretty recent. 
but I guess these are like the the main ones in their opinion, the the big brands. Didn't realize Drake was so new. Drake was given its name because it sounded cool. Just so you know, not not trying to talk crap about Drake, but just remember that when you think about sophistication and the kind of brand that you want to align your name with. And over that, we have some very old ships, people ships that people think are quite old. Uh, we have the Hornet, we have the Aurora, and we have the Gladius. However, as you can see, there is quite a gap from the current day to these old ships. Uh, so let's talk about one that is a bit older than that. So, the RSI Zeus. So, in 2130, hold on. In 2130, uh, RSI made some major kind of advancements in quantum technology. They developed, or they released, the first ship that was kind of available to the mass market that had quantum capability. This kind of mid-range explorer uh, really put RSI at the kind of forefront of ship development. Now, it was a really good thing. You know, it really kind of boosted them as a company, but that doesn't, it wasn't kind of all good. The original RSI Zeus had some major issues with its whole integrity. That being said, there's always kind of been this uh, demand for RSI to release the Zeus. It's kind of had this cult following that's grown up over the years. I'm kind of very happy to announce today that RSI have kind of taken that challenge on board. Um, they've developed a whole new vehicle that is designed to ferry a whole new generation of travelers across our universe. Oh, yay. Visually, it's something that pays homage back to the original Zeus and something that's really uh, is, is justified to have that, that name. And I'm even happier to say it exceeds all current safety standards. Not going to lie, our current ship production. this ship seems pretty good for the size. Am I mistaken? Ah. Okay, then. Here it is. So, uh, we are going to hand over to Elwyn and Mark to go through this. And you can see there's three of them there. So, we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive onto these three ships now. So, over to Mark and Elwyn. Mark and welcome. I actually on, really do... Um, I'm not crazy about the design, but I really like the sort of philosophy, I guess, behind the ES as an explorer. Really solid size. It's in that size range I like, and uh, it has all the facilities I like. So I got my eye on it, but eh, not crazy about it. Croto, thank you for the sub, by the way. Appreciate you. Let's go. Space Doritos. Hi there, everyone. My name is Mark Gibson. I'm the lead vehicle content designer at Cloud Imperium Games. And I'm all about to <laughs> And I'm Owen Bachelor, vehicle art director in North America. What do you guys think? Yeah, you can solo one of these. Pretty sure this thing's around MSR size, a little smaller. Right, well, let's take some time now and take a look at this classic RSI design and see how we've reimagined it. So when we decided we wanted to tackle the Zeus, we had to consider what direction RSI would take it in if they were going to do it today. We couldn't just remake the original Zeus because although it was obviously a massive piece of history, all it was really used for was transporting and moving around. So we had to consider exactly what we wanted to do with the ship. In the end, we decided to go for three variants, allowing you to pick which way you want to actually play the game. So what we're going to do is talk about those variants that we decided on in the end and go into a bit more detail with them. First of all, we have the ES. The ES is the essential. It's the long-range exploration version of the Zeus. It's designed to let you go out for a long time and explore the universe. Next up, we have the Mark. The Mark is the bounty hunter version. Yeah, this I really like the ES. So you can actually go out, find your targets, and bring them back. It's also been purposely outfitted so that you have all the tools that you need to disable, capture, and bring them home. This is going to be a recurring theme, though. The weirdest part of this whole Citizen Con is how often the uh, subject of scanning and radar came up and they just didn't talk about it. 
This is the cargo version. They talked about it, but conceptually. This is designed so that you can move your goods around the universe. This seems like a solid cargo hauler, cargo though. Of the three variants, the Zeus Essential is the one that harkens back the most to the original design with the original white on black paint job and the vertical stabilizers. We also worked to maintain the silhouette of the original, but brought that forward to modern day RSI design with tons of technical detail and layered panels. And on the underside, the landing gear and the underslung turret, as well as the entrax, ent entrance ladder, fold in perfectly flush, leaving behind a super smooth underbelly, just like the original design. But you probably all want to I see bet what you, the inside looks like. You know, I'm thinking maybe uh, ships are going to start getting bigger in their gold gold passes because it seems like they have made a conscious decision to start having weapons store inside of ships. Maybe that'll be particular to certain brands, but it does sound like they're starting to do that with more and more ships, specifically like super recently. So maybe they're going to try and make that a standard across ships and we'll see some ships grow in size a little bit so that they can store their weapons. So that's we'll see though. Look. That'd be a big change. Despite the sleek and slim body of the Zeus, we've been able to pack a lot into it to give everything you need when you're doing the deep space exploration. You have a fairly comfortable habitation recreation area so that when you're out away from home, it's not too unpleasant. In addition to that, the rear room has a 32 SU cargo capacity as well as being able to fit a cyclone. So if you do decide to land our planet, you can have a look around. Talking about the loadout, it's a ship designed for three crew. It comes with four size two shield generators. That's so much. Two That's, size two wow. power plants, two size two coolers. How does this thing have double the shields of the MSR? I don't get that. Size four pilot controlled Size two power plants, two size two coolers, and two size four pilot controlled weapons. I guess the two size two power plants are gonna struggle to keep those uh, shields fully, fully loaded if you're doing anything else, huh? And obviously the lower turret that Elva mentioned earlier is a size three remote turret. Now the Zeus Mark was always designed from the beginning to- There's supposed to be a docking port for that one? Looks like the en there's an entrance on the front left. Let's see if I can go back. Yeah, I don't know. It would be right here. Right? It's like right behind. It's like the glass and then a section and then the port. So the glass section port would be like right here. I don't know. They're rebalancing the shields. Yeah, I'm sure this will get balanced quite well. Leak and aggressive bounty hunter. As such, the black paint will help you stay hidden in the shadows until you're ready to strike. We've also redesigned the spine in order to embed an EMP and a quantum dampener, which allows us on the art side to really crank up the level of detail on the exterior. We've also added a second remote turret on the top. Looking at the interior of the mark, you see that the habitation's taken a little bit of a hit. It moved forward, but what we've been able to add in exchange for that is a massive armory that lets you take all the different weapons and equipment you might need while you're tracking your target along the verse. Looking into the rear, we actually have a dedicated area just for the actual um, bounty hunter pods, similar to what you'll see in the Cutlass Blue. So you can stack up the pods and take multiple people back with you. It has less SU than the ES. It only has 16 SU. And it does have a different loadout with the components, only having three size two shield generators. Like Ellen said, it does have a top mounted forward facing turret so that you can put the pressure on the target as you're chasing them. The EMP and QD drive are designed to stop the target escaping once you've caught up with them. Now, because the Zeus Clipper focuses this is the on cargo version. cargo, we've decided to lean into the industrial aesthetic. We've covered the exterior with a warning strip paint job, uh, and we've covered the exterior with more technical detail and armor plating. In addition to that, it comes with a remote tractor beam, which is mounted on the rear to the side of the ramp to make it easier to haul cargo in and out of the cargo hold. We've also added thrust capacity to the base of the wings. 
As you can see, there is an absolutely massive rear to it compared to the others. The habitation areas have been massively pushed. It's a massive rear to it. Space, but we can get way more cargo in. It actually has four times the cargo capacity of the S coming in at 128 SUs of cargo. Gosh. This one also features three size two shield generators. And like Al mentioned, it has a size three tractor beam to make it much easier to get those cargo containers in and out as you're actually playing. Wait, what? What do you think? Wait, 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 wait. Did he just get that wrong? Hold on. He said, he said size three tractor beam. Size zero is multi-tool attachment. Size one is handheld tool. Size two is supposed to be vehicle. Size three is supposed to be the um, SRVs exclusively, no? Hold on a second. Um, yeah, I guess we could actually just go and look it up. Zeus CL. Because that doesn't make sense. Maybe it was just going off the old, uh, the old sizes. Pretty sure it's a size two. It's probably a size two. Let's assume it's a size two. As long as chat's confirming. Chat's always right. To make it much easier to get those cargo containers in and out as you're actually playing. What do you think? <laughs> so, last year we introduced the Spirit. And if anyone that may be playing on their live cup live the last couple of days, might have seen a new ship adding to the verse, the A1. We hope to follow a similar route with the Zeus where we announce it today, and then in about a year's time, hopefully it'll be ready to reveal to the public to actually play with. But this isn't just a concept. We're not just going to show you some images. The Zeus is actually in active white, dot, white box development right now. Do you just want to have a look? OK, see, that's. Shall we? So that makes sense, because this is definitely going to be a more difficult ship than the Spirit to make. So it's good it's already in white box. It's believable we could see this in a year. All right. So as you guys have seen with the Spirit and with the many ships we've released... It's definitely smaller than a Corsair. Right. Watch Level Cap land a Corsair in this space yesterday, and it, was, it fit this more fully. So as you guys have seen with the Spirit and with the many ships we've released thus far, our ships can, when they're finished, look absolutely gorgeous. But before any of them get to that point... The art was for an ST. This one? Yeah, MK2 ST. Is that an extra turret? Do any of the other ships have that turret on them? Is this one? Yeah, the, uh, the MR has a turret on it. But the this one doesn't. So maybe the ST is like a, another kind of combat sort of style. Can't imagine they'd put a turret on a racer. But they like to show almost everything shooting. It's got two turrets actually. So who knows? But we announced attack. This have a look. Okay. Yeah. All right. So as you guys have seen with the spirit, this looks white box. The many ships we've released thus far, our ships can, when they're finished, look absolutely gorgeous. But before any of them get to that point they have to grow through a very specific development process. And this is the first stage in that process. We call this white box. At this point, we've taken the concept, ripped it to shreds, and- I white do really box. like that. At this the, point, the back we've of the taken ship. the concept, ripped it to shreds, and then reassembled it and plugged it all back together within the editor so that we can get a real good look at what players are gonna see. They all have underslung turrets, okay. At this stage, with the Zeus, we've already ripped out all the thrusters, we've ripped out the landing gear, the turret, the seats, the beds, all of the interior spaces, plug those guys back in, and we have what you see here. So again, the beginning of the process. At this point, we're able to jump in, start throwing in cargo, interacting with doors, getting in and out of beds, maybe in and out of toilets. 
and just getting an overall sense of what it feels like to interact with the vehicle. And it is very common that in this stage, we will make some adjustments from the original plan. As an example, on this ship, we've just made the decision to expand the center corridor, add a little bit more space to the rooms. We see the center corridor. Some adjustments from the Still pretty vehicle. small, huh? And it is very common that in this stage, we will make some adjustments from the original plan. Oh, actually, As no, that's example, pretty thick. On this ship, we've just made it's the very wide. to expand the center corridor, add a little bit more space to the rooms. And as a result, that's going to make it much smoother experience for players to traverse the, in the, the interior of the ship, as well as for AI to traverse the interior of the ship. We've also expanded the main airlock that leads to the enter exit ladder. And up here, oh the yeah, there cockpit, you go. We've separated so the co-pilot. It's it's an airlock with a ladder. It's like it's probably like an interior room, um, with a little door in the bottom that opens for a ladder. You guys are right. So there are two entrances. That's what they need to put on Crusader ships. Ladder. Why don't Crusader ships have this? I guess they're probably going to add them in at some point. And up here in the cockpit, we've separated the co-pilot seats a tad bit just to allow players to get in and out a little easier. So with white box, not the prettiest stage in the process, but it is essential that we nail this because it means we'll be able to deliver a beautiful ship that is also extremely fun to play. So that was the RSI Zeus in the three variants. Obviously, as the screen says behind me, it's available now on the Star Citizen website. You all follow that URL or the QR code behind me. I have a QR code. Now, we've just talked about the ship with the longest legacy in the universe. It, it was the first ship of the quantum travel. Let's change pace a little bit and talk about a much newer ship. We're going to talk about the Cutter. Good little ship. Big surprise. So, obviously, last year, IE, we unveiled the Cutter, and you guys seem to love it. Some interesting information about it. It was actually the single most popular straight-to-flight ready ship we've ever released. You guys really, really liked it. In addition to that, it's actually the best-selling Drake ship to date. But what people didn't know, and we kept a very good guarded secret that no one managed to figure out, no one, that was always meant to be a family of three. Now, what everyone is already familiar with is the base. That's the version that's out in the universe right now that you're already enjoying. What we're going to do today, though, is we're going to talk about the next variant in the family, the Scout. So this is probably... This is probably the Reclaimer snub ship, right? Meant to help with salvage and crafting and stuff. In the family. The Scout. All right, let's just take a minute and sort of enjoy the incredible work that the R team has done pushing this guy out. Cutter is a great starter ship, safety. When the original Scout was, I mean, when the original Cutter was released, it helped us to refine the Drake aesthetic. And now with the variants, we'll be able to add a unique identity to each version. On the Scout, we've decided to replace the main thrusters with a dual thruster system. And you'll see here, we've also added a radar dish to the top, which relates directly to the scanning gameplay that comes with this ship. In addition to that, we have a series of exterior bottom modifications to just push that flavor a little bit further. And you'll see here a transition between the default to push that, that flavor a little bit further. And you'll see here a transition between the default to just push time. that flavor a little bit further. And you'll see here a transition between the default and the scout, so you can clearly see the differences. They're subtle. <laughs> 
On the interior, we've expanded the rear section of the ship in order to include a dedicated standing scanning station, which will show up here in a second. Along with that, we've also increased the space in the rear to house the larger components that are necessary. Yeah, to this makes that, that, that makes the Terrapin look like it wastes so much space. Increase the space in the rear to house the larger components that are necessary to support that gameplay. Now, expanding the rear did encroach into the habitation, but we were able to rearrange the components in that room so that nothing was lost in the transition. And on the cockpit, it's the same cockpit that you all know and love from the original cutter. From this view, you'll more clearly see the shift that we had to make in the rear in order to support the gameplay that we're trying to achieve. Oh, I we're love really the Terrapin. We're proud of what the team has done with this ship, and we hope you like the Scout as much as we do. Yeah, but like, what's the gameplay? This is like one of the only times during the convention, in my opinion, where they still kind of introduced something and then dropped the ball on the future of that something. A lot of the other stuff, they'd introduce it and then it'd be like, hey, check it out in game. But now we're about to, you'll see. So, obviously, we've just introduced the Scout. What are the main differences between the base? There's a variant after all. So the first big difference is the radar. It has a size two radar, and to accommodate, to supply that, it comes with a size two power plant and a size two, two, size two cooler. Getting tripped on my words. As well as the dedicated scan terminal that Ella mentioned earlier. Obviously, as you saw, habitation got a little bit cozier, and unfortunately, it has lost two SU compared to the base. So it only has two SU cargo capacity instead of the three. Now, what we also want to do is talk a little bit more about the future of scanning, if people are interested in hearing about that. So what is the future of scanning? We'll touch on it lightly. At the moment, there are two main ways for you to interact with the scanning gameplay loops. The first one's obviously the scan, and the second one's the ping system. Both of these are going to be merged into a single system known as a scan wave. When you send a scan wave out, if you get any successful pings, what will happen is it will immediately populate your HUD with an AR marker, giving you information about what you've been able to scan, as well as starting to give you far more interesting information than you get now, rather than just the name of the ship. The underlying system will work on the signature system, similar to what it does today. And there are two main scans. There is the quick scan. The quick scan is just a low version of it. It has a very small impact on your own signal output. So if you want to stay a little bit more covert and potentially not be seen, looking at something you shouldn't, you can use that one instead. The main benefits are small increase to your actual passive detection range, as well as being able to detect things that maybe are a little fainter than you should be able to see. This has a decent amount of cutting through interference, but not phenomenal. The other version is the charge scan. The charge scan is the big scan. Now, this will actually allow you to detect things up to quantum boost range, which is way, way further than the current passive detection range. And not only that, but it'll actually drop a marker allowing you to jump straight to that location for whatever it is that you found. So we've, we've actually seen a concept of this. And the, I think the worst, this is, again, like I said, I think this is probably the most just like old citizen con um that they get during this citizen con what am i looking for quantum boost it it definitely like they would have shown us this in game if they had something working for this and i'm actually kind of surprised they don't so here was this is it simulated they scan the scan goes out um you can see that they start getting some ar markers in the distance here you see marky mark down here in the Bottom, not actually Mark and Mark, Mark Hamill, but um, this is kind of like a Squadron 42 situation. And so you can see that like they scanned, they got the ping, now they have a bunch of different places they can jump, and they're charging up the Quantum Boost, which obviously looked a lot different back in that sort of dev branch version last year. Um, but that's the idea. That's what they're talking about with this charged ping. And this is actually even one step removed from deep space probing 
uh, which would require you to send actual probes out into the system and those would do the pings themselves and you'd triangulate this would be on the, the, the scale of like astronomical units as opposed to this which is like 50 30 20 000 meters so doesn't sound like any of it is really close to coming which is interesting because i do I'm, I'm betting this needs to happen for squadron but i'm guessing this isn't something that they want us to have in the next 20 or 12 months or think we will now you you don't want to be jumping in blind and as i said it's going to give you way more information than it did before some examples, but not limited to this, are things like whatever it is, is it charging a quantum drive? Is it firing? Is the shields generating? Does it have any shields? Is it perhaps charging an EMP? Maybe it's got a snare up trying to catch you. It gives you that additional information so you can make the decision whether you actually want to get to that location. That's just a brief glimpse into the future of scanning and what our vision is for it. Vision. Right now, the scout is actually in 321. It's available. If you go to that address or go to our website, QR code, it's actually in the universe right now. You don't need to wait for a patch for that. I've been Mark. And I'm Elwin. And before we step off, if you haven't had a chance to get one of these hats, this one in particular is signed by seven members of the ship development team. And if you want it, when, during the meet and greet, if you can tell me the name of the seven people who signed this, all of who are in attendance here, by the way, today, the first person to give me those names gets to keep it. Other than that, thanks, well, guys, and have a great sitcom. Small hit for you. John Crew is one of those names. <laughs> well, fantastic, guys, everyone. I wonder if anybody got that. John and Ben, they've got a few more surprises for you. Let's see how we're doing on time. Right, so as Mark said there, scanning stuff is coming in the future. Um, we didn't show a lot of it uh, because it does sort of turn up in some other teams' panels and we didn't want to steal their glory a day early. So I highly recommend sticking around for both the UI one and the flight one tomorrow. So we've talked about the past, we talked about the present, let's talk about the future. So here is a big block of squares that represents our backlog. Okay, so I each will one of say these squares is a ship or a looking bit. at this, it has been clarified um, that these these blue ships are these dark blue ships are indeed all just released in um, the year. It's not it's not coming for the rest of the year. So I was wrong about that. Um, the reason I think I got confused mostly is because they already had released ships highlighted up here but i also probably could have just listened to what he said apparently it's it's clear if you hear what he says but um yeah keep that in mind this these these dark blue ships are all ships this year not ships coming by the end of the year that'd be a lot vehicle uh all the light blue ones are all the ones we have released to date all those gray ones are the ones that we have not done yet See, no. that, I think that's what throws other people off, too, is he literally says all these light blue ones are the ones we've released to date, not before this year. So, I don't know. Dark blue ones are the ones that will be in your hands by the end of the year. So, we have over 200 vehicles for us to support as a vehicle content team. Um, for those of you that are trying to do the maths in your head right now, going, that's, that's the wrong number. This includes uh, every single vehicle that we've ever shown to you, whether that's in a Squadron 42 visual tease or like a, um, a trailer. Some of them are obviously Squadron exclusives. Some of them are going to be NPC exclusives. We still have to support them all. So every vehicle in the game, we have our hands on, and we, we do a lot of work to lot. support them for you. It's a lot of work. Not the only thing we do. We obviously introduce new content like the Mirai Fury. Uh, we deliver previous promised content, and as you'll see today and tomorrow, we do a lot of gameplay support. So obviously we help out ships that are like the heroes of the game. Uh, you saw in the resource network uh, engineering uh, panel how that's going to impact ships. We'll get to that one. Uh, you will have seen, if you've been paying super close attention, uh, some UI elements to do with maps. 
Stay tuned for that. Uh, we do all that. So we do a lot of work across all aspects of both projects. Uh, and to do all that, we need to do a, a few things. OK, yeah, so John's talked a bit about the backlog. Um, I'm going to kind of take a little bit of you know, how, how are we going to deliver this. So in April 2023, we actually kicked off a, a new ship team. For people um, who say that CIG, I, now I will say CIG has problems with communication. For people who say that CIG doesn't listen, doesn't answer, doesn't respond, doesn't actually work together with the community to build this game, this whole part of this panel is because of the community. If I don't, if people didn't make noise about this last November, December time, this probably wouldn't have been something that they felt they needed to include and talk about here. They would have just continued talking about ships coming and how they're improving making them. They wouldn't have specifically said, this is what we're doing to complete the backlog, just so you know. And I think that's important to note because like, people offhand will just say that this company is running away and doing whatever, but like they, they get held accountable in some ways. And that's why it's important to talk about these things. Our newest studio, Turbulent, based out of Montreal. Yeah, go Canada. Um, so we've now got um, five artists or vehicle artists, uh, one vehicle designer, one embedded QA tester, and one producer. And that kind of gives us everything we need to start bringing content out of another location. Um, and it also means that we now have kind of reps globally for the vehicle content team in all five of our studios. What's the really nice thing about that is, is it kind of opens up a new pool of a kind of talent that we can pick from. And it should you know, really help us to deliver some more content to the game. And you've actually just seen the first two ships out of that studio. So the Scout variant and the Zeus are both being developed by our Montreal team. Yeah. They're, they're doing, doing great. Montreal is always doing good stuff. Um, we're going to look a little bit more in depth at the kind of the art team and, and how we've grown over the years. Um, you can see from this graph, this is our kind of like live numbers of how many vehicle artists we have dedicated to the project. Um, you can see there's a nice trajectory going up. Now, don't don't take my word from this. This is a this is a third party source, if you will, but uh, a one I trust. This. Right here. I don't know if it's both of these or just this second drop here. Um, is at least partially attributed to Star Atlas. And is partially, if not completely, why the Banu Merchantman ended up getting shelves last year. And I think like there's kind of an important angle to to look at that from. Uh, the fact that their employees can get poached by competitors for things like this goes to show that maybe CIG does not have the ability to raise salaries, you know, to keep people competitive. Um, and it, it could also explain some of the more hefty marketing tactics and, and things that we've seen done that some people will say has been done more for money, uh, taking advantage of certain opportunities like the F8 and stuff like that. But I think that it's this 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 slide is like a really great example of, oh, yeah, CIG is a business and like they have to pay salaries and they have to make sure employees actually can live on those salaries with the places that they live. And if they can't, those people will leave. And if those people leave, then ships slow down. And if ships slow down, the money slows down and that can cascade. And it's, um, you know, people will talk about CIG like they're flushing cash all the time. But they're running, they're running close margins. And I like that we get to see that uh, this kind of stuff happened and, and how they're responding to it. Um, and you know, with more team members, that also means we get kind of like not just more people to throw at stuff, but we get more experience, we get more knowledge. Um, and that's, you know, that allows us to kind of tackle our larger, kind of more complex ships. You will notice there in 2022, there is a, a little dip. Um, and you know, unfortunately, when, when that happens, that has kind of real consequences on what we are able to do as a team. I think you know, less people, so less power to put on stuff, but also some of that knowledge leaves us. 
with that, that leads us to have to make some kind of pretty hard and heavy decisions about what we're working on. And I think most recently and probably most well known is the Bami Merchantman. Yeah. Now, we're going to take a quick look at where we got to with the Merchantman just to show where we were up to before that happened in 2022. I am not a uh, crazy proponent of the Banu Merchantman, but I understand the fever some people have. I don't know how the heck they're going to make this work, um, and I think that's even kind of part of why this ship probably should wait a little bit longer to come out. It's basically a floating bazaar. And you're going to see a lot of rooms here in a second in the interior that kind of points towards that idea of a floating bazaar with shops where you're bringing in people and you're selling stuff and talking about stuff and having meetings. And it's like, how many things need to come online for that to work? That being said, it, uh, it, it, it does a lot for funding. So show it off a little bit. <laughs> Well, see, me wanting a ship is, is, I mean, I'll have a Bandu Merchantman. I'm not flying it though. Check out the giveaway ongoing guys right now. Just a little shout out, exclamation point giveaway. will make the link pop up. We are giving away the uh, Crusader Spirit A1, the ship you saw at the beginning of this video. So if you like bombing people, get in. So you can kind of tell, even in the white box version of this ship, you can see how much different the architecture is from all the different ships. So when he says, we lost an artist, we lost that knowledge, they don't have other people who know how to model this stuff. Like every ship is unique. So the people who work on that ship kind of have to build out that, um, that branding. And since this is the first ship from sort of this quote unquote company at this size, they're, they're basically inventing these designs and those obviously take practices that not many people know. So when they lose those people, they have to go back, find someone else, train them how to do this, make sure that they're proficient at it, and then build the ship. That's why it's taken so long. So that video shows you know, where we got up to with the merchantman. You can see we'd finished white box. We were kind of into gray box. Some areas were further than others. And I think one of the best things about working at a company like Cloud Imperium Games is that we're able to be pretty honest and pretty open with our development. 
one of the biggest questions we get is, what's up with the merchantman? Where is it? Why did it stop? Um, and you know, the merchantman brought a lot of unique challenges to us. It was a completely new art style, something that's very, very different from what we normally do with our human manufacturers. I think you know, we could have paused other ships. We could have moved some of our other artists onto the merchantman. But with the kind of exodus of our kind of senior team in 2022, um, we didn't just lose people. We lost a lot of the knowledge that went into building out that white box and really kind of delivering that art style. What we decided to do at the time is rather than try and rush something out and just get something out to, to get it done, we looked at where we were. And for us, the most important thing was growing our team back up. We wanted to invest in our team and use our seniors and our kind of managers to help get us up to the point where you know, we can tackle multiple large and capital ships at one time. I think the graph previously kind of showed that you know, we've got the head numbers now, and now it's about onboarding our new staff members. It's about skilling them up and getting them to the point. And I would absolutely love to be stood here on the stage and going, yeah, look at the merchant, it's amazing. Like, it's, you know, it's done. Um, but we're not at that point just yet. We do see all the comments. I do see all the, the notes about it. And you know, I absolutely want to get this ship out and done. Um, and you know, we'll, yeah, I just wanted to be open and honest as to where we are up to with the development. Yeah, uh, to, to add to that. Uh, hey, Algrid, how's it going? We got an info runner here in chat. Can we go back real quick to this graph? I just realized when he was talking about like the team and rebuilding it and getting it into a functioning position and saying that we have the heads. And then looking at the size of the team when he says we finally have the heads and it's 28. And then you're like, wait, but everybody says all this, all this company does is work on ships. It's like 28 out of over a thousand people. Why was there an exodus? Um, they didn't really go into reasons why. Just that they, they lost some people all kind of in the same year or two. And, you know, we'll, yeah, I just wanted to be open and honest as to where we are up to with the development. Yeah. Uh, to, to add to that, it is probably the most question I get asked at any event. And I really want to get done, get it out for you guys. But we don't want to give you a half-baked thing. We want to give you a really great product that we can all be proud of. And it's delivered alongside gameplay. So let's talk about something else quickly. <laughs> so, Squadron 42 vehicles. How many of you have an Idris of some kind? <laughs> uh, right. So, we plan to deliver the Idris alongside, the squad alongside Squadron. And that doesn't mean just the M. We're going to deliver the M, the P, and the K kit all together in one delivery. Cool, 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 cool. cool. Javelin owners, I'm afraid, you're going to have to wait a bit longer after that. Is obviously the bigger ship players can own. Uh, and we have recently looked at what is left to deliver on it. We've got plans. There will be modularity with it. Um, and yeah, that will come after squadron releases. And those of you who also have uh, the Vandal Scythe, Glaive, Blade. After Squadron releases, you will also get the updated uh, models as well for that. Right. Next. OK. No kind of ship panel at a CitizenCon event is kind of done without looking at what's coming up next. Um, previously, we used to do these kind of like silhouettes. Um, but we, we kind of always felt they were a little bit predictable. We ended up just making most of them anyway. Um, so, so last year, we changed things up. We, uh, we asked what manufacturer do we want to see uh, make our next large mining ship. Um, and you're going to see more about that at IAE next month. Um, but again, this year, we decided just to mix things up a little bit with how we wanted to deliver this. So you're about to see in a minute a video. Uh, it shows uh, some ships you might recognize. Hopefully, it will show you some that you don't recognize. Um, but feel free to get on Spectrum afterwards, take a look, give us a guess at what you think they might be. 
um because we'd love to you know hear your input well, we've gone over um, this here on the stream well. oh. we aim to deliver everything you see in this video and more in the next 12 months so we've uh gone over this a little bit so i won't pause it too much i'll just kind of point stuff out if we see it um but yeah this is a lot of stuff so this kind of looks tumbrel in my opinion tumbrel hovercraft i think it is off the ground and you can kind of see the same sort of design from their storm tank which i would i think would be cool design language sounds pretty cool it's the x1 i was hoping this would come by the end of the year but we still don't know um there have been hypotheses so you're talking in info runners just a couple days ago yesterday um that this might be an ambulance version of the ursa note the man yeah note the man that also indicates size as algorithm points out in chat this is the mpuv showing off some modularity opportunities this is um nobody really knows <laughs> Nobody knows what this is. This is a weird one. It doesn't match anything. It doesn't look like anything we know. It looks like it actually has a drop-down cargo uh, cargo grid, also. I didn't notice that before. This is something new, likely from Mirai. Here's the Legionnaire. This is a hacking ship, which could confirm hacking gameplay in the next 12. This is the um, Zeus with the little ladder, as pointed out by Ten earlier in the stream. Retaliator, I think, pointing towards modularity and the gold standard for this ship. And the Polaris, which obviously gets all the claps. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but there was quite a big ship. Looks more like a wing weapon to you. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It looks like a. Uh... It looks like boxes. I don't think it's the Apollo, because the Apollo is not this thick, um, and it would be bigger than this. I think the Apollo would be a little bit longer. The wing goes out here, though. This looks like it's directly under the ship, because you see the landing gear is over overlapping it. These look like fake boxes, but who knows? I'm sure we'll hear more about this at some time soon. Maybe IAE. Let's touch again on like, yeah, probably next year. An RSI ship? Like, what is with that? So. The thing about doing another RSI ship is that we've got a really well-established art style for RSI in our, in our universe. Um, and it gives us the ability to kind of skip, or train up newest members of the teams on something that's kind of quite a known element. That is absolutely not the only benefit, though. The way we are like, planning on tackling the Polaris is not tackling it as one ship, but actually we want to tackle, well, anyone that knows our backlog knows we have a number of large RSI ships on there. And our kind of plan is that we tackle that as a family of ships. We don't just tackle one of them and then we go off and do something else for six months, a year, come back and do another one, something else, come back and do another one. We want to tackle them all together, one after the other. And what that really allows us to do is just kind of streamline our development process. We're able to, you know, for our more common areas of the ship, we're able to build kits that we're confident in that we can reuse and we can make the most out of them. And then that allows us to focus our development time and our efforts really on the much more unique and the important and exciting areas of each ship. It, tackling them as a family kind of allows us to expedite their development. We leverage the experience that we've got within the team. And it just allows us to, like I say, streamline everything. So first up, we've got the Polaris. Next up, we've got the Galaxy. Then we've got the Perseus. And that kind of closes out our most of our large RSI ships. And then we can you know, see what we want to take on after that. Well, I, I think that's pretty much everything we want to talk about today. Um, however, before we go, we're, we're going to... Torsten's already stolen the, the predictable joke here. So we'll do one last thing to show you guys. So let's have a look at the current state of the Polaris in-engine in its white box state.
the update on the monthly report on this ship is going to be telling um, this ship being in white box they're going to have to bust out on this one because the Zeus is in white box and they want both these ships to come in the next 12 months so they've got work to do on this one was going bonkers right now. The mics are muted. People were going nuts in the crowd. So yeah, that's about it, folks. Um, talking ship, that's kind of what's going on with ships in the near future. And they've got a lot to do. I obviously they're trying to now tackle ships in a better way than they have been, um, and they're getting a team into a place that can act over time for a long amount of time. So that's good. And they've got a strategy for it. We'll see how much they can pull off and what they can do in the first year, I guess, and judge them based on that. But I like what we're seeing. I like that there's a lot more ships coming into the game as opposed to concepts being introduced. And the the, the ships that are introduced are generally pretty far along we'll have to see how the golden passes go though and all that kind of stuff but that's it for me today folks thank you for joining hope you learned some ship stuff now i'm going to pass you all on to another good friend i'll send you over to meyer looks like he's playing some pyro hope y'all enjoyed the stream um we will be back again tomorrow. Tomorrow will be even better because we're going to be doing engineering gameplay. So that's going to be a very interesting discussion. Um, so I will see you guys same time, a little bit earlier, normal time. Uh, but same place right here on the stream. We'll be talking, having good times. Guys, get in on that giveaway. Try to get that A1. And uh, if you do, give me a ride around in it because I do like the ship. Anyways, cheers, folks. Appreciate you all. Hope you enjoyed today. Catch you all later. Have a good one.